Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Modem Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. Members get behind the scene notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called Skin, and is about round pegs and square holes. It's been a long time since Rosa felt like herself. Not just mentally, though partially mentally. She's made some decisions she would struggle to explain, but her whole body feels off. She moves carefully, because her centre of gravity is not quite where she expects it to be. When she walks, she stumbles, because her feet hit the ground a bit earlier than she thinks they will. She collides with chairs and door frames because her body doesn't match her muscle memory. When she walks, she stumbles, because her feet hit the ground a bit earlier than she thinks they will. She hasn't mentioned this to Dev. It's not worth bothering him with. He's got enough to worry about with his job and looking after her. He doesn't need something else added to the pile. Tonight, he's out blowing off some steam with the boys. She has a meal ready and waiting for him. A beer in an ice bucket, and she's wearing the apron he likes. It's short enough to make it very clear to even a casual observer that she's wearing nothing else. Soon, he will be back. For now, she sits, staring at the blank television screen, her own face staring back from its monolithic glass. Her face also doesn't match what she thinks she should be. She can't decide if it's just slightly out, or so wildly different she might as well be a different species. It's hard, not being comfortable in your own skin. The door opens, and Dev enters. He's been drinking, but he's not drunk, having walked the happy line of getting buzzed without falling asleep in a bush. Hey, sexy, he says when he comes in. What we got to eat tonight? She watches him eat, legs crossed. They have sex four times. Dev goes to sleep happy. When he is asleep, Rosa gets up again. She puts her apron on and does the dishes. It's cold in the kitchen thanks to the draught from the window that doesn't shut properly. She has the sensation of being watched. She's had that a lot lately. When she turns out the light, she thinks she sees someone at the bottom of the garden. She switches the light on again out of instinct, then realises this has blinded her view. On switching it off, there's nothing to see just her reflection. That night, like every night, Rosa dreams of skin. She is in the forest. Forest with a capital F, the warehouse club on the banks of the mighty river. It's a thumping, pounding, writhing mass of bodies and beats. It is the pathways that open through the dance floor and close behind you as if they had never existed. It is the foliage of designer labels and skin-tight dresses. It is rhythm, it is noise, it is sweat, and it is skin. Dark and pale, toned and tired, sensual, shivering skin. Go into the forest, they say and you might never find your way out. She dreams of movement. She feels her body sway like it's supposed to, feels her arms slide and hips swing with smooth feline grace. She doesn't overbalance. She doesn't stumble. She dances. She dances with Dev, and she dances with the guy and the air is full of magpie feathers and she will dance here forever and she loves it. In her sleep, Rosa smiles. The dream is worth the day. Rosa's days are predictable. She wakes up before Dev and fixes some breakfast. Bacon if there is any. Toast with some other less optimal topping if there's not. Dev will choose a position and location for morning sex and will then go to work while Rosa cleans up. Next, she will spend some of the day exercising. It's important to stay trim. 
excess weight, at least in the wrong places, is not to be tolerated. Then she will go to work. She works on the third floor in a sleek office block that looks like it was designed to be launched into orbit. She is an accountant and has no idea what she is doing. That isn't quite true. She can make the little entries dance across her spreadsheet as well as any other number witch. But it's like it comes from muscle memory. She doesn't understand why her brain is solving the problems the way it does. The knowledge is there, but none of the ability to think about it. She can't remember any of her colleagues' names. It's similar to how she has sex, she thinks. She writhes and she moans and she screams with passion, all of it less because she wants to than because she has a nagging feeling that it's in the script. During lunch times, she will go into department stores and look at clothes. She will go into bookshops and gardening centres and supermarkets. She doesn't buy anything in any of them. Dev manages all their money. She tries not to be outside too long. The city, much like herself, doesn't seem quite right. She knows these streets, but the angles seem wrong. She hurries on every time the transmitter mast appears, beaming its signal from the ridge. It feels out of place, like a unicorn at a zoo. These are Rosa's days, and they are simple. There was only one difference between today and a normal day. Today, she was being followed. The first time Dev took her to the forest, the price of admission was a lock of hair. She'd snipped it off at the door with a pair of nail scissors, and the woman behind the window with the maze tattoo over one eye had tied it up with a red ribbon. They had gone inside, into the shifting paths of the dance floor, and Dev had led her to a table where he'd shaken hands with the guy. The guy. You know the one. The one who sat a couple of tables over in the bar, or in a private booth at the club. The one with the beak-shaped nose and the magpie feathers in his hat. You must have noticed him. He's always there. Well, he's noticed you. I can guarantee that. Rosa doesn't remember what they talked about. It probably wasn't important. The second time Dev took her to the forest, the price of admission was a kiss given to a scrap of gold paper which was placed in a sealed envelope. Dev had asked the woman with the tattoo if he could give it to her directly, and she'd laughed like someone paid to make out they hadn't heard that joke a thousand times before. The guy bought her a drink, and the rhinestones in his jacket made him shine like a mirror ball. The third time Dev took her to the forest, the guy was waiting at the door, and he'd put an arm around Rosa and said to the woman with the tattoo, Not this one. She gets in free. That was the last time she remembers feeling like her skin fit her bones. Someone has broken in. There was no sign of a force on the door, no windows broken. But the flat is ransacked, clothes strewn from wardrobes, whole kitchen drawers pulled from their mounts and their contents scattered across the floor. Pictures have been taken from the wall and are stacked in untidy piles face down. She's sure she locked the door. She checks the windows, looking for entry points. Exit points too, she thinks. Are they still here? It's the kitchen window. It's been pulled open from the outside. But it faces the back garden and the broken lock is invisible from outside. How did they know? She tries to remember if she has mentioned the broken lock to anyone, but this is foolish. She doesn't speak to anyone except Dev. Still, she knows what she must do now. She tidies up. The smallest picture is one of her and Dev on holiday. She thinks it was in Italy. She's wearing her favourite red dress and Dev's got his arm around her. They're both smiling at the camera, eyes shaded against the sun. She realises she hasn't worn that dress in ages and wonders why. The house is almost clean when Dev gets home, but not so clean he doesn't notice something's wrong. What happened? Rosa tells him. Dev's face starts at annoyance, accelerates towards anger, does a handbrake turn and skids into terror. 
No, 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 no. He runs to the bedroom, almost knocking Rosa aside as he moves. She follows, confused, to find him rummaging under the bed. The storage box is underneath, thrown to one side, his body half covered. She hears an, oh, thank Christ, and his body visibly relaxes. Did you see who did it? He asks, pulling himself out. No. Have you told anyone? No. Yeah. Yeah. Probably best. Christ. He goes to grab a beer from the fridge. Hey. You alright? I'm fine. Yeah. Good. Good. They don't have sex that night. Not even once. Dev is still agitated the next morning. He eats breakfast in silence, with occasional glances back toward the bedroom. When he leaves, Rosa prepares for work herself. She almost wears the red dress, but something makes her decide against it. In her office, she makes the numbers dance. There's a satisfaction in watching herself make them form up into neat little rows. And the fact that her brain is managing that on a subroutine means that she can think about other things. Like what Dev was looking for under their bed. Has she ever looked under their bed? She must have done, surely, once. At least once. Was he keeping money under there? An engagement ring? Drugs? Did he do drugs? Did she do drugs? Her thought process is interrupted by one of her co-workers, a recent graduate with long black hair and purple lipstick. Hey Rosa, Peter said you'd have a copy of the latest filings for DMP? Yeah, sure. What's your email? I'll send them over. Lovely, thanks. She quickly looks around and bends close to Rosa, whispering conspiratorially. And look, don't know if you've heard people saying anything, but I just wanted to say, don't listen. The boob job looks fantastic. She winks and leaves before Rosa has time to protest that she's never had a boob job. But she thinks about all the times she's walked into door frames because she wasn't the shape she thought she was. And she thinks about the nights in the forest when her body felt like her own. And when she gets home, she doesn't get started on Dev's dinner. She immediately strips off her work clothes and pulls out her favourite red dress. Something is still telling her not to wear it. She forces it down. It doesn't fit. Too large around the waist, too small around the chest. She scrambles under the bed. Taped to the slats is a Raspberry Pi, attached to a tiny transmitter and a USB drive with a magpie printed on the side. She yanks out the USB and plugs the drive into her work laptop. There's a .hexe file which she knows enough not to run, and a document called Changes. She opens it. Inside is a list. Longer legs. Obedient. G-cup. Flat stomach. Always says yes. Screamer. She thinks about Dev. The house party where she met him. The first date in the pop-up fairground. The first holiday they took together. She realises she can't remember moving in with him. What did you do to me? But she knows where she can answer that question. She pulls out the magpie USB with more force than strictly necessary and goes to the forest. And again, someone follows. It's relatively early when she reaches the forest, but she can still hear the bass thump a thump a thumping from inside. The entry price is three drops of blood, but the girl with the tattoo of one eye looks at her and grimaces. You're good, you've bled enough. Do you want to check your coat? Rosa stares at her. I'm not wearing a coat. Oh! The girl smiles. My mistake. The guy is sat in his booth, a bottle of cheap lager in front of him. 
He raises an eyebrow when Rosa slams the USB down in front of him, then gets up and gestures for her to follow. The forest parts in front of them as the guy leads her to a back room, where the music is just a dull vibration through the floor. It looks like a dressing room, with a battered sofa, a mini-fridge, and a small table sticky with spilled spirits. That's better, the guy says. What can I do for you? You can tell me what this is. Rose's voice is tight with anger. It's the first time she can remember feeling something for a long time, and it would be a lie to say she wasn't enjoying it. A spell, the guy says simply. It's designed to overlay a new personality construct on top of a set of imprinted memories. Becomes permanent eventually, though in your case I'd expect it to take at least another month before that happens. Rosa's mouth drops open. She wasn't expecting quite so matter-of-fact an answer. And what was it doing in my house? The guy smiles, like she's a child crying after doing something they've been told not to. Not unkind, but also not with much sympathy. I think you've already worked out that part. Rosa slumps onto the battered sofa. Just tell me, please. I need to hear it. It'll cost you. Tell me, and I won't call the police. I doubt that would help. But yes, a threat. A threat is adequate payment. He pulls two bottles of cheap lager from the fridge, cracks them both and hands one to Rosa. A few weeks ago, I was engaged by a young man who was dissatisfied with his partner and wanted an improved version. G-cups, Rosa says, bitterly. Amongst other things, yes. He told me what he wanted, a list both physical and mental and rather unimaginative. He provided a few reference pictures which you're welcome to see. I delivered as requested. Just like that. Why the hell would you do this to me? For the first time, the guy looks nonplussed. Because he paid me. Is this a trick question? So now I'm stuck with this. You are quite beautiful. But I'm not me! Rosa yells. She gestures to her breasts, her stomach, her legs. None of this is mine. Put me back. Ah. Uh, I apologise. I think there's been a misunderstanding. I didn't change your body. I designed it. What are you talking about? The guy holds up a finger. Wait. He taps the air once. Twice, three times. There is a knock on the door, and it opens. Hey, boss, the girl with the tattoo says. Someone here to see you. And Rosa stares at the woman the girl has brought in, eyes wide. The original Rosa looks at the Rosa on the sofa and says, I think we've got some stuff to talk about. Drinks are on the house. Rosa and the original Rosa are sat in an alley around the back of the forest. The guy has returned to gaze upon his dance floor. Dev, I do not care about Dev. Imagine some fate for him if you wish, but this was never his story and his role is over. I will not waste your time on the exploits of boring men. Original pours another two shots from the tequila bottle. You know, she says, I thought you were the bad guy at first. Rosa doesn't answer, just stares into her glass. She'd come here to find out what had happened to her, and she'd left not knowing what she even was. 
just that her skin didn't feel like her own because the skin she wore wasn't her own and she had no idea what was inside it anymore. Like, I'm in that place, right? Original gestures behind her to where the forest still thumper thumper thumps through the wall. And I come out of the loo and suddenly I'm not there anymore. I'm at some party in the back roads and that's like, that's a trip. But I figure I'm there and I can't do much about it so I may as well enjoy it. They gave me some of this thick black stuff to drink and I was just gone, man. He thought I was the bad guy, Rosa prompts. She doesn't really want to hear the story, but Original feels like the only solid thing in the world and she needs an anchor. Yeah, right, so I'm there for, I don't know, a couple of weeks I guess. And then I wake up in my bed, in my flat, without so much as a hangover to show for it. And I go to call Dev, but my phone's gone. So I go to see him, and instead, Rosa thinks, I'm only two weeks old. Then no, this thing is two weeks old. Whatever I am inside, who knows? Instead, you saw us. Yeah, I saw you getting properly freaky. Rosa knocks the tequila back in one hit and pours herself another large measure. Original suddenly realises what she's talking about. Oh god, sorry. I shouldn't be... You just looked like you were into it. It was horrible what he did to you. You too. Yeah. Think you got it worse though. They're silent for a minute before eventually Original says. You can stay with me if you want. I never lived with him. I've got my own place. You don't have to go back. Thank you, Rosa says. She thinks for a minute. Was it you who broke in? Yeah. I'd worked it out by that point. Was looking for whatever the spell was anchored to. Dumb idea. Didn't even know what I was looking for. It was under the bed. Huh. The back door to the forest opens, and the girl with the tattoo emerges. She's got another bottle of tequila and a cigarette clenched between her lips. Sup, bitches. How are you managing? Original shoots her a scowl. Seriously. The girl shrugs while lighting up. Eh, you two ain't the worst I've seen. You should see some of the stuff he gets asked for. And he does it. You pay, he delivers. Those are the rules. Original looks like she's about to say something else, but Rosa interrupts. You asked if I wanted to check my coat. How did you know? Were you part of it? Nah, strictly staff, me. I mean, I knew about you because I saw the setup, but I could tell anyway. How? The girl with the tattoo stubs out her cigarette and flicks it away. Then, with a quick glance up and down the alley, she shrugs off her clothes. Then she shrugs off her skin, and as it falls you can see it's not a skin, but a coat. And the thing that was the girl stands with switchblade fingers and a face like an overcast sky. And both Rosa and Original are pressed against the wall in terror because suddenly they share the alley with one of the hounds of love. The hound looks from one of them to the other with a surprisingly delicate touch, puts its coat back on, and the coat becomes skin, and the girl with the tattoo stands in front of them again. Rosa says, Is... is that what I am? No idea, the girl says, fumbling with her dress. Might be. Might be a different one of the others. Might be a person. Might be a fox or a swan. Might be some ether construct. The boss don't discriminate. I can tell you how to find out. But it'll cost. What do you want? The girl thinks. An admission. Something true about yourself that you wish wasn't. But I don't have anything like that. I don't know anything true about me. 
come back when you do, then. I'll pay for her, Original says, and looks the girl in her tattooed eye. I really liked him. I wasn't sure he was the one, but... But I thought he might be. I imagined us with children. I would have done that with him. The girl nods, leans forward and whispers something in Rose's ear, then winks and goes back inside. What did she say? She told me how to take it off. Do you want to? No. Well, yes, but not yet. I don't think I'm ready to see it yet. I mean, if you're okay with... She gestures to the body that isn't quite originals. With this. I won't say it's not going to be weird, but sure. I'm gonna need a favour, though. What? Hang around somewhere nice and visible with CCTV for a couple of hours. I'm gonna go back in there and see what I need to pay for a can of mace and a crowbar. Why? Because, Original says, I'm getting my red dress back. Modem Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, performed by Kate Angier, and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. Check out my other show at lostterminal.com. It's got more science and less dread. If you like what we do, check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Our next story will arrive with the next full moon. Your skin is just a coat. Wear it when you want to, and discard it when you don't.